Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. As we go into 2024, I thought it would be good on this Wednesday to just review some of the things that we've talked about for the past seven years. And I'm gonna begin right at the very top of this outline, this list that I have. And uh, I highly recommend that you save this video and perhaps watch it from time to time because it's, it is somewhat of a summary of all the things that we've talked about. Things that I think that are important, much more important than, you know, when they're going to build the, the third temple or when, you know, how many earthquakes we've had or, or what's going on in the heavens above or, or anything else. We're talking about uh, doctrinal issues that pertain to the Christian life. What is the Christian life? Well, I'm sure if you asked a lot of Christians that question, you'd get a lot of answers. I'm going to tell you, suge I'm going to suggest to you that the Christian life is Christ. It's not, uh, the Christian life is not about Christ. Uh, it doesn't, it isn't something that has to do with Christ, but it is Christ. For me to live is Christ, said Paul. And so I'm going to begin on that basis where that the focus, our focus is entirely on Christ. And I want you to take note as we go through here how that each one of these aspects that I'm going to talk about seem to confirm that reality that it is about Him and not ourselves. The focus is on Him, not ourselves, which I believe is the predominant focus today. So I'll begin with the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have the, the written Word, uh, which literally becomes the living Word uh, in our lives. Uh, something that's, I guess for lack of a better expression, it is so the Christian life today is so far removed from what we typically, I think, I'm going to suggest it's it's so so far above and beyond what we typically think is the Christian life that it's almost it almost seems surreal. Yet we can know and experience this life, this life that is Christ, and I think that in order to do that. I think we have to be, our lives have to be consistent. Our doctrine, our theological position has to be consistent with the Word of God because it's the Word of God that changes our lives. We don't conform our lives to the Word of God. The Word of God conforms our lives to Christ. The Word literally has the power to change our lives. Uh, to make us more like Christ as we continue our life and our walk here below. It's the Word of God, not man. We're not interested, and I've pointed this out in many, many videos as we've gone through verse-by-verse -verse studies or, or just about any other uh, topic that we've discussed as far as Scripture is concerned. We're not looking at the logic of Paul, the reasonings of Paul, the thoughts of Paul, the thinking of Paul, the strategies of Paul or anything else like that. What we're looking at is we're looking at the Word of God. We're not, we're not look, looking to try to understand the rational reasonings of those whom God chose to write His Word. Uh, those who merely held the pen, instruments in His hand, to give us the revelation that we have today. So we're talking about, this is where I want to start. We're talking about the importance of the Word which we live in a world today, I believe we live in a world in which the emphasis on the truth of the Word of God really doesn't take first place. We tend to want to focus more on our experiences and, and uh, our, you know, dreams, visions, you know, signs, miracles, wonders, you know, uh, our testimony, our own personal testimony, our own personal faith, uh, rather than the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk about. 
So it begins with this. And when we talk about faith, which is something more precious than gold, I would love it if I had two tons of gold sitting here or that I could contrast, use that as an illustration to, to show you just how important faith is in the life of the believer. Our faith is more precious than gold. Okay, but problem is I couldn't find anyone that had two tons of gold to loan that to me to use that as an illustration here. So you're just going to kind of have to go without the, the, the uh, physical illustration and just accept the fact that based upon the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God is that our faith, our faith is most precious. It is more precious than anything that you could ever possess. And so is the Word of God. You are privileged, you and I are privileged to hold God's Word in our hand, to look at it, to feast upon it, to study it, to meditate on it, to pray over it. It is God's gift to us, His revelation, apart from which we would have no understanding of the nature, the characteristics, or evidence of God. So it is important, and that brings us to the most important thing, I believe, in all of this discussion, and that is the nature of the gospel. What is the gospel? Is the gospel that, hey, I've got some great news for you. Here's what you need to do in order to get right with God. No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is not what you must do for God. Or if you will do something, then God will do something. That's not the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is what Christ did for you and for, and for me. That He was crucified. He lived. That Christ lived. He died, was buried, and raised from the dead all according to the Scriptures. One of the hottest debates in Christianity today is, is divine election. That God chooses a family. Okay? We, have, we simply have no right to suggest that God does not have a right to choose a family. A casual reading through the Gospels will confirm the fact that there, there was seed that Christ did not sow. And there was seed that He did sow. That there are sheep, there are goats, there are wheat, there are tare. God has a family. And we as believers in this present dispensation, just as in any other dispensation, going back to the beginning of time, to all the way back to Adam and Eve, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't know what you want to do with that verse. You can include that in your... In, when you go, go about building your theology, your personal theology, you're establishing your theological position as a Christian in this world. You can include that fact or you can not. You can ignore that fact and I can assure you that you, that will take you off on the wrong path rather than the right one. It does make a difference. Christ chose me in Him before the foundation of the world. I had no say-so as to whether or not I became a Christian that, I know that shocks many Christians, but this is what that book teaches. This is what this precious Word of God teaches us. We became Christians by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. We were born again from above by the Spirit of God, by the Word of truth, and that by God, not of ourselves. God was not waiting on us to make a decision. God does not wait on a dead man to make some decision to be resurrected from life, to, to life. Okay. Lazarus did not make any decision 
It wasn't Lazarus come forth if you decide to. That's not what happened. Now, I can stand here all day and talk about divine election. I think many Christians know this, but somehow they've got it in their minds that they've, they've, become to, they've come to think that it's a cooperative activity between us and God. Oh yeah, yes, Pastor Steve, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. But in order to make that, that fact true, we had to choose Him. Now, folks, I'm not, I'm not stupid and neither are you, all right? If the matter rests with man, not God, that if in the final analysis we hold the, the trump card, so to speak, and that, and that our destiny is determined by our decision, then election makes no sense at all. Why, why would God even mention the fact that we're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world? Either we are, or we were, or we're not. Now the truth is, is that God chose you in Christ. It was if you believed, if you received, if you accepted, if you did any of those things, it was because God had already infused life into you. You were quickened to life. Life comes first before anything else. Anything else. Before anything could happen in your life, you had to first be made alive. That is what happened. Now, it may appear to you that God did something based upon what you did, but the truth of the matter is that, well, it's just the reverse. You did what you did because of what God did. And, of course, the argument's always been, well, that's not fair. That's just not fair. You know, God chose some to eternal life and He... And he didn't choose others. I mean, that just, that, Steve, that just can't be fair. That's just not fair. Who are you to question God? Who am I to question God? Paul points this out early on in Romans. This brings us to the matter of the new birth itself then. As new creations in Christ, you are not made a new creation in Christ to, to then function out of the old nature of which, you're, of which you're being delivered from. We as Christians, I've pointed this out over the past seven years, we as believers in Christ, were made new creations in Christ Jesus. New creations. We are dual-natured individuals, not single-natured individuals. Dual-natured individuals. When we look at the conflict between the flesh and the Spirit in Romans chapter 7, you are looking at a conflict which exists in the life of the believer because you have been made a new creation in Christ in which you have two natures, one, one which is absolutely righteous, sinless, according to 1 John. His seed abides in you and you cannot sin. It's not, I understand the text, that most, many of the translations say that we don't can practice, continue to practice sin. But, Folks, that is not what the text says. It says that we do not have the ability to sin. The new nature cannot sin. Your new nature in Christ doesn't have the ability to sin. It, it, it's impossible. It cannot sin. We're looking at a God who is absolutely 100% righteous, who begats children of His own. We are children of God. We came from Him. He made us that new creation in Christ. And God does not, cannot, will not make us new creations in Christ with the ability to sin. 
it is a very liberating truth that we have a new nature that cannot sin. Yet at the same time, we have an old nature that is it's not capable of doing anything other than sinning. The flesh profits nothing. That which is born of the Spirit is of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is of the flesh. You cannot clean up the old man, the flesh, to make him righteous and acceptable to God. It doesn't make any sense anyhow to even try to do that when the new nature is what is fully righteous, as righteous as God's Son. Most Christians today are walking this planet unaware of the fact that they've been made a new creation in Christ, that, that when the Father looks at them, looks down at them, He sees them as righteous as His Son. That is an enormously liberating fact. I mean, just every... Let me, let me, let me suggest this to you. Let me, let me just point this out to you. I've been a Christian for many years. There's never been a day, not a single day, in my life as a believer in Christ in which I did not believe that God made me fully righteous he imputed the righteousness of God in my life as a Christian and that my new nature is fully righteous, just as righteous as God's Son. And there never has been a day in my life as a Christian in which I thought that, the old man, that God intended for me to, to work hard in trying to clean up the old man, the old flesh, to make the old flesh acceptable to God. Not one day. Not one day. I can say that in all honesty because I learned these truths the moment that I was born again. Many Christians don't. And, and, it, and it breaks my heart that they are deprived from the liberating truth of that primarily because this truth is not being taught today. You would be hard-pressed to find any preacher that is going to tell you that you stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. So this is the basis upon which we approach God in our day-to-day -day walk, our fellowship, our communion, and our worship. There's the nature of the old man. There's the nature of, of the new man. We are told in Romans 6.11, the first command given us in the New Testament to reckon, that is count it, it's a bookkeeping term, reckon it as true that we have died to sin, but we have been made alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's the two natures. And this reckoning, this daily ongoing activity of reckoning ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God, is vital. It's a vital, ongoing, daily activity in the life of the believer. If it's not, there's going to be frustration and failure. Of course, from God's standpoint, I need to point out, there is no failure in the Christian life. Everything is purposed for a reason. No matter what you're going through, God is in control, and that's God's sovereignty, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, something which I have talked about in just about every video that I've ever done. There is a motive in the Christian life. We have, there's always a motive, a reason for why you do something. Our motive is often thought to be love. Well, Steve, okay, we're not under law. But it's the love motive. You know, we just, just love, love God. Love one another. Love God. Everything will work out great. Dearly beloved, your love will fail. If you haven't learned that yet, learn it now. Your love can fail. Your love will fail. Your love for me, your love for fellow believers, your love for God will, will fail. It will, it will be demonstrated in a way some circumstance will, will come into your life 
which will cause you to become aware or should cause you to become aware of the fact that, uh, that perhaps you didn't do what you thought that you ought to do and the reason why you didn't is because you just, well, you just weren't loving enough. Dearly beloved, love is a characteristic, just one characteristic, the greatest, I'll point it, faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love, but it is nevertheless a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, which comes in a package. It's not, God doesn't hand it out piecemeal. Okay, well, uh, you know, Pastor Steve, I prayed so hard for faith. Wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you realize your need for faith. I'm glad you realize your need for patience. Pastor Steve, I just need, I just need patience. I, I got to work on that patience thing, you know? Folks, we're talking about characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit in which if one is manifest, they're all there. If one is missing, none are there. So God has imputed His, His very own righteousness to us. What a gift. What a blessing. When it comes to the matter of sovereignty, God's sovereignty versus our responsibility, it's always been a heated argument. It's always been that way all down through the ages. Well, which is it? I mean, you know, uh, who has really has the upper hand here? Who, who is really in control? Does God just step back and allow us to do what, what we do? And, and His future plans for us is determined very much based it's based upon the outcome of of what we do let me tell you something else that i've never believed i've never believed that god has for just once ever taken his hand his loving guiding hand off of you his child as believers in christ we are loved by god we are guided, directed, comforted, many other things by God. God does not allow anything to touch your life except it be for your ultimate good. If it's not for your good, it's not going to happen in your life. You can rest assured that no matter what this life brings, no matter what you do, no matter how much you fail, and I put that in quotes, God is in control. He knew it all beforehand, and He promises to work all that out. All things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Oh, Steve, but I don't feel like I love God all that much. Yes, yes you do. Yes, you do. We have to be on guard for all these attacks against our enemy. We love Him because He first loved us. It is so true that, that there, it is strength through weakness. When, it's, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. If you want to try to power up the old man and clean him up and make him acceptable to God, you're going the wrong way. If you see adversity, if you see weakness, if you see failure, and again, I put that in quotes, in your life, just understand it doesn't catch God by surprise at all. There's, there's a purpose in all of this. We are made strong through our weakness. Why is that? Because it is in our weakness that we trust Him. When we talk about ourselves being strong, now we're talking about well, something quite different. We're talking about our trust and our dependence being upon ourselves. We trust ourselves. That's what we're doing. We're trusting in ourselves. We depend upon ourselves. And dearly beloved, we have been so indoctrinated over the past, I don't know how many centuries, to believe that that's the case. That, that we just, God is depending on us. Oh, God is, 
God, I've actually had believers walk up to me and say, Steve, God's really depending on me to do this. And again, they've got it backwards. <clears throat> it is not our, de our depending upon self. It is not God trusting in us. It is our, it's all about our trusting in God. There's a purpose for trials in our lives. Suffering. How could we ever learn to trust Him? This is what we're looking at in our survey through Acts. How could I possibly ever come to know that I've trusted Him unless God puts me in circumstances which cause me to trust Him? I could give you a lot of personal examples. You know... A, rel a relative of mine passes away. Uh, I'm devastated. I'm driving down the highway. Uh, I'm just looking at asphalt, uh, trying to take take all all of this in. Uh, I'm saying over and over, Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I must have said it a thousand times. It's when you know that He's there with you in whatever that you're going through. And that He has your best in mind, even though it doesn't seem that way. We know that all this leads to true praise and worship. All of that which is of the flesh leads to a, a, a false praise, false worship. We know that He's the vine, we're the branches. We know that from John chapter 15. It is the vine that produced the, the fruit in our lives, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He's the vine. We're the branch. We're the conduit. The branch does not produce the fruit. And again, we see how that, that, that directly ties in with the fact of, of the reality of the two natures. We don't clean up the flesh. To try to, clean up, to try to clean up your life and make it, make it acceptable to God is for you to be somehow thinking that you're the vine, not the branch. You just kind of thrown the, the vine aside. Him aside. You've made yourself the vine. Well, if you're the vine, who's the branch? We know one waters, one plants, one waters. God causes the growth. God causes the growth in your life, dearly beloved. And I'm going to suggest there's not a single child of God on earth in which God is not causing the growth. He's no respecter of persons. He, is, he doesn't cause growth, spiritual growth, true spiritual growth in the life of one Christian and not another. When Jesus Christ died on a cross, we talk a lot about you know substitutionary death. It's not a it's not a well he he'll he died for you if you'll accept him. It was a substitutionary death. He died in our place. And we were justified, made righteous. We stand before God righteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. But many Christians are not aware of the most important fact that the, the, the cross that crucifies, which was important for our justification, is just as important when it comes... Our death with Christ is, is just as important as it concerns our sanctification. When He died, you died. When He was buried, you were buried with Him. When He rose from the dead, you rose with Him. It, now, if you really want to, to be accurate about this, you must have ascended with Him when He ascended. Because Scripture says that you are now co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Well, how did you get there if you, didn't, if you weren't ascended with Him? Dearly beloved, Jesus Christ has so closely, God has so closely, identified you with His Son. If you are a child of God, 
You have been so closely identified with Him. A thousand sermons couldn't, couldn't shed proper light on all of that. When you look at the end result where we become like Him, and in the end we'll have a body like His, it's not hard to see that from the very beginning to the end, we have been so closely identified with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that it staggers the imagination. Staggers the mind. When he, when he died on Calvary, He took you down into death with Him. Why was that important? Why was that important? Because it's not about you. God isn't interested in, in removing just the sin out of your life. I mean, that, well, it's the old man's going to sin. He's told us to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God. His object, His goal is to remove the Christian entirely. And He did that through death, burial, and resurrection. You've been raised to walk in newness of life on resurrection ground. That's where we walk. That's where we live. That's where we breathe as Christians. As those who have been made alive from the dead. This is our walk. It's all based on His person and His work. We have God gave us the greatest example of failure in all of human history, and that was His people Israel. They didn't do anything He told them to do. If you, if you are a believer and you have not come to the realization that Christ Jesus fulfilled the law, the, he, he is the very fulfillment of the law. And that He's now living in you. If you haven't come to that realization, then you, you're going to flounder in a sea of despair in trying to keep the law. Trying to, to, to somehow match up to what you believe God's expectations of you are. Is. Are. That's however you say that. Oh, but Steve, what about all the scriptural imperatives? I know that I, I, I read the Bible too, Steve. It says do this, don't do that, uh, don't do that, do this. If you, if you do this, this God will do you know, this. And if you don't do this, God... Dearly beloved, let me just ask you a simple question. How would we ever know God's character, God's nature, God's righteous, holy, righteous nature? How would we ever know that if God had not expressed His will in His Word the way that He did? You can't throw out the fact that, we're, that it's, it's through weakness that we're made strong. You can't throw out the fact that the old man, the flesh, profits nothing. You can't throw out the fact that the most important aspect of our Christian lives is trusting in Him and not ourselves. Same with the word obedience. Most Christians today, and I've talked about this in a number of videos, the word obedience, obey, all of the derivatives, obey, uh, obedience, uh, obe uh, obeying, uh, the word is hupakuo. When we look at faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God, the word hearing is a kuo. Hupokuo is the intense form of of the word here. The word obey means it, it's literally the intense form, the most intense form of the word here. It is an active verb, but it, it doesn't require any action on your part as far as you doing something. The word do is poieo, not hupakuo. And yet somehow we've mixed those two, we blended those two words together to where that in the minds of most Christians today, obey means do, and it doesn't. The word obey does not mean do. It means to hear. And if you go through all 66 references in the New Testament, 
of the word obey, with all the derivatives, what you will discover is that we have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching which we were delivered. You really open up a can of worms when you talk about free will, the free will issue. I mean, I mean gosh, I mean, that's, it's probably the toughest uh, point to try to get across to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. You have no free will. Well, Steve, of course I do. Okay, I went through, I drove through Taco Bell and, and uh, you know, or, no, let's see, I, I drove through McDonald's, uh, or no, let's see, I don't like that one either. I drove through Arby's, you know, or I, and, and I got a, a garden, fresh garden sandwich, uh, and, and uh, I could have, I could have, I could have tater tots or I could have curly fries, and I chose the curly fries, so by God, Steve, I have free will. That's true. That's true. I, I think when I'm done with this video, I'm probably going to uh, make a peanut butter sandwich, and I've got strawberry jelly, and I've got peach jelly in the ice box, and I'm probably going to choose peach. That, that's free will, right? Dearly beloved, listen. If, if, you don't, if you haven't come to understand, <laughs> there's an enormous difference between having the freedom to choose when it comes to what you eat or whether you go see this movie or that movie or whether you you decide that you wake up one day and you decide you want to I'd, I'd like to have a, a dog uh, rather than a cat Don't bring those discussions into this. Let's go back to the beginning. New man, old man. The new man can only do what it does. That's righteousness. The old man can do no righteousness. It can do nothing but sin. That's all the old man does. You have two natures that are in constant conflict with one another. Now, you're, you want to talk to me about free will? It's a whole nother sermon, I suppose, is uh, when we go off talking about, well, Steve, and I can hear it now. Well, Steve, I, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that. But how do we function more out of the new man than the old man? And we may talk about that some more in the future. There is a thing called positional truth. Positionally, we stand righteous before God. In our condition, it may, we may not appear all that righteous. We have to, as believers in Christ, folks, we have to learn to discern between what is good and acceptable to God and what, and what is not. We can live the Christian life because, only because, it's Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. More on all of this later. I hope all of you are staying warm. Stay warm. Keep looking up and rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.